Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual U Miami Health Talk, Cancer Prevention, Understanding Your Cancer Risk. I'm health journalist Ileana Bravo, your moderator for this evening's webinar, which is presented by Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, part of the University of Miami Health System. You know, Sylvester is the only cancer center in South Florida with designation from the National Cancer Institute. Sylvester goes beyond conventional care, specializing in cancer prevention, diagnosis, and survivorship, and now offers a special clinic for those at higher risk for certain cancer types, as well as the genetic predisposition syndrome clinic that serves people who are diagnosed with or have a close family member who has been diagnosed with a genetic component to cancer. To learn more, please go to Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center's High Risk and GPS Clinics by checking out SylvesterCancerPrevention.com. To schedule a consult, call 305-689-RISK-7475. So tonight, we're privileged to hear from oncology experts, Drs. Tracy Crane, Nicholas Borja, Carmen Kalfa, and Daniel Sussman. Here are the discussion topics for tonight. How lifestyle impacts your cancer risk, how genetics influence your cancer risk, navigating genetic predisposition syndrome, and understanding high risk factors of gastrointestinal cancer. At the end of the presentation, you are you can participate in our Q&A session. It's a unique opportunity to ask direct questions of our experts. Don't, uh, please take advantage by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to enter questions as you think of them. We'll prep them for our experts. And by the way, we have a special guest, Haley UT, who is president and co-founder of the Eileen UT Foundation. She'll be joining us for the Q&A session as well. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our very first panelist, Dr. Tracy Crane, a distinguished leader in cancer control. She works at the intersection of lifestyle medicine and digital health with the goal of developing targeted interventions for patients to deliver the right intervention at the right time. She co-leads the Cancer Control Research Program and directs the Lifestyle Medicine Prevention and Digital Health Initiative. Please help me welcome Dr. Crane. You can start sharing your presentation and make sure you're not muted. Okay, thank you so much, Ileana. That was nice and very nice introduction and a warm welcome to everyone who's here tonight. We're excited to be here. So I'm going to kick us off by talking a little bit about how modifiable behaviors such as lifestyle behaviors can impact your cancer risk. So I want to start off by saying today is a leap year, but it's the last day of February. But in fact, February is National Cancer Prevention Month, so it's the perfect time uh, to spread this important information all about how these lifestyle factors that can help you reduce your risk of cancer for Americans across the United States. So up on the slide here to, right now, I have showing all of these modifiable behaviors that can increase cancer risk. And although we have a limited amount of time, I think it's important that you see that there are many factors up here that we have control over. So tobacco smoking, for example, excess body weight, alcohol, uh, UV you know, from the sun, poor diet, infections, and physical inactivity. And so you can see that some of these factors are upwards of 20% are contributing to um, US cancer cases in the United States. If you were to total these all up, you can see that when we start to lump things together, excess body weight, poor nutrition, physical inactivity, excess alcohol con consumption actually equates to about one in five cancer cases in the United States. So this is highly motivating for me. This is 20% of all cancers. This is the focus of what I do every day. And furthering that is that overweight or obesity raises a person's risk of getting one or more of 13 different types of cancers. And so when we know, unfortunately, in the United States, about 74% of US adults are either overweight or obese. So I like to think about giving out prescriptions for things that are, if, if, if we were to think about the reductions that we could see if we were, everybody were to eat a healthier diet, move their body more, maintain a healthy body weight, if there was a medication that we could take to do this, we would have people lined up down the street um, if they could reduce their risk of cancer by nearly 50%. The important thing is, is that all of us can do these things each and every day. And small incremental uh, increases and in changes in these behaviors add up to a big difference. 
So the, unfortunately, there's a limited awareness of these key cancer risk factors in the United States. And a recent paper that was put out by the American Society of, um, of Cancer came out and said, you know, that most Americans correctly identify tobacco use. Nobody will argue that tobacco causes cancer, 78% of Americans. However, sun exposure, a little bit lower, only 66% recognize it as a major risk factor. Only 31% of Americans recognize that obesity is a risk factor for cancer, even though it's the second leading cause only to smoking uh, cause a death in the United States. And then very few Americans are aware of these other lifestyle factors that increase risk, including alcohol and lack of exercise. And so modest steps to reduce cancer risk, so fewer than half of Americans actually say they're doing this. So that slide before was like, who's aware and who's of these different risk factors? This is who's actually doing it in the United States. And so you can see about 48% of Americans report that they use sunblock every day um, and, and limit their exposure to the sun. About 48% report that they exercise regularly. 41% report they're trying to maintain a healthy weight and about 38% are limiting their alcohol consumption. You know, the good news is we have a lot of room for improvement here in the U.S. And so hopefully when you leave here tonight, you feel like you've been empowered to make these changes. So what are the recommendations? These are, these are questions I get asked all the time. And so these are recommendations that come out from the American Cancer Society. And there are different societies. If you type in cancer prevention guidelines, you're going to get many different organizations that are going to have various recommendations. The good news is, is that among the national groups, these recommendations are virtually the same. If you look at the American Institute for Cancer Research, the American Cancer Society, um, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, you're gonna see that they are very similar. So any one of those recommendations that you choose to read and follow are good and evidence-based. So specifically, when we think about getting to a healthy weight throughout the lifespan, we know that, at, that exercising is really important. And you'll see at the bottom that there's something there that looks a little different than the other recommendations because I have added it. I think it's really important that we um, give credit to strength training and how important body composition itself, not just the number on the scale, is important to cancer risk. This is one of the forefront areas that are leading research right now is that it's, it's not just aerobic exercise. That's very important but also strength training is critically important because of the impact strength training has on muscle mass, particularly as we age. Uh, and then limiting sedentary behavior. This is an easy one. All of us can do it. All of us are guilty of being on our screen, a small screen or a big screen and, and not moving our body and we get caught up standing. You know, if you really wanna be looking at something, is there a way you can be moving? Can you be not sitting down after you eat in particular? I always encourage people that after a meal, Try to keep your body up and keep moving. That really helps us utilize um, and, and our glucose stores instead of just sitting down after a big meal. Um, and then avoiding lying down. So all these sedentary behaviors, when you can start to think about eliminating them, getting up on commercial breaks to take a short walk, those little things do add up. Parking further away, they sound silly, but they make a big difference, are taking the stairs, in fact. So following a healthy eating plan, this is probably the number one question I get asked is what should I be eating? And so we know that probably your mom was right, right? I suspect that many of you had mothers that said, eat your vegetables every night. And she was correct. These are This is the number one thing we can do from a dietary perspective is to increase our intake of, of, of these nutrient rich plants. So thinking about shopping the rainbow, all these different vegetables and fruits provide different components that help us reduce cancer. When we think about, people will ask me, well, should I take a supplement? The things that are in pills are missing all the things that the whole food has. So there are preventative things in the skin of vegetables. There are things that are in the pulp of, of citrus fruits. Eating the whole plant is important. So when you think about your diet, think about a predominantly plant-based diet. This means things like beans, legumes that I that are going to help you know increase your fiber intake, whole grains, and then limiting things that are not so good. So added sugars. You know, recently when the food label was redone, they actually had to add a line that says added sugar. This is important because before it just said sugars or carbohydrates, and you didn't really know what was added. And so that meant that things that were naturally occurring were just being lumped in together and it made it really hard for the consumer to understand what was added. So familiarize yourself with the food label. That's one of the number one things I teach people is learn how to read a food label and see what's being added into your food. 
Um, another thing is to reduce your consumption of red meats. We know this is a risk factor for things like colon cancer, and we have Dr. Sussman here, so he'll also be talking about this perhaps. But, um, you know, red meats and things like processed meats, so these are our lunch meats, our, the bacon, sausage, they really do have a significant increase that we found now over time, especially for colon cancer. Um, and then don't drink your calories. I think that we, it's it's easy to drive through a, you know, I'm not going to name names. It's easy to drive through a coffee chain and pick up a drink and you, before you know it, you've consumed 600 calories in a, in a beverage and it doesn't leave you satiated or full. And now you've got to eat. And if you've had one of those, even it's a large chunk of your calories. So thinking about where you're getting all these calories from, and are there easy places you could make modification? Uh, one of the things that people don't like to hear, but we do know now, is that it's best not to drink alcohol. This was the most recent recommendation that we added to the guidelines, um, is that we now know that alcohol consumption does, in fact, increase our risk of several different types of cancers. If you do choose to consume alcohol, make sure you know what a portion size is, and I have it listed there on the screen. Take the time to understand what a serving size of alcohol is, because when you go um, and you're making things at home, wine glasses that we have at home are more than likely not five ounces where we're filling them. So educate yourself. So at least you know, and you are aware of what you are consuming. So I'm going to shift gears a tiny bit. Um, so one of the things that I get asked is, well, you know, I have, I'm at high risk. Why should I even care about these lifestyle behaviors? So there was a very recent trial that came out that was looking out of the uh, United Kingdom and their biobank cohort. This was a huge cohort. cohort. You can see it was almost 450,000 people who donated samples. And they had about, over time, about 26,000 cases of cancer that occurred. And what they did is they started to look at these cancer site specific, so breast cancer or prostate cancer or colon cancer, polygenic risk scores. That's what they started to look and they wanted to effectively identify people who were at higher risk of individual cancers. And unfortunately, we don't know exactly how these risk scores play out. So they wanted to study that. But then they also wanted to study because they had collected a lot of information about these people over time about what they ate, how much they exercised, did they use tobacco, what was their body weight. And so they were able to look at together when you have a high, what they call a cancer polygenic risk score for 20 different sites of cancer. And then what about your lifestyle behaviors? And these lifestyle behaviors, like I said, included smoking, alcohol, um, exercise, and their body mass index, as well as their diet. What happens and what, how does this infect your, impact your risk factor? And so what they, what they found out was that in fact, this high genetic risk score that they calculated was associated with an, a, high, a larger increase in incident cancer risk independent of lifestyle. So this means that their risk score was probably pretty accurate. The participants with the highest genetic risk score and the unfavorable lifestyle had the greatest incidence of cancer. That means that they were at higher risk, genetic risk, and they had a poor uh, lifestyle choices. They were at the very highest risk compared to those who had the lowest risk factors for cancer as well, genetically, as well as the most favorable lifestyle. However, within these genetic risk groups, they found that adherence to healthy that healthy behaviors was consistently associated with a reduced absolute risk of cancer, even in the presence of um, genetic these genetic risk factors. And so I think a picture's worth a thousand words. And so I'm going to walk you through this very slowly. But you can see up in C where you have the men here, overall cancer polygenic risk score. And these top slides, top two, the men and the women, what they are showing you is that in fact, the red is a high, a high score, genetic score for cancer. The blue, the kind of lightest blue in the middle is the medium risk. And then the one on the bottom is the lowest risk genetic risk score. And then, and then you have incidence of cancer. So as it goes up, you can see more over time how much cancer is occurring. And on the bottom, you can see, which is probably the most impactful for now, for today, is that the, the people who had the less favorable diets are in red. The middle ones are the intermediate favorable, you know, the intermediate score of, of lifestyle factors. And then the blue on the bottom had the best score. And you can see they, in fact, clearly have a lower risk of cancer over time if you were eating a healthy diet. So compared to participants at low genetic risk, those at intermediate or a high genetic risk had a 27% increased risk or a 91% increased risk for cancer overall. These differed by men and women. And then they also showed a joint effect of lifestyle factors on overall cancer risk was observed. So you can see almost three times higher for men 
and about two, 2.4 times higher for women when they had a higher genetic risk score and these unfavorable risk factors from their lifestyle behaviors. So I think this is a really powerful message that, you know, you can say, you know, you can't change your genes, but you can change what you eat and what you do every day, the body weight, what you choose to, if you choose to smoke or not, or drink alcohol or not. And these do in fact have an impact um, even in the presence. So people ask me all the time, you know, in a very limited amount of time, what should I be doing? So one, my number one rule for cancer prevention is do not use tobacco products. For me, this also includes vaping. I think that we are at the tip of the iceberg of understanding what vaping does. There's maybe some gray area with vaping with tobacco cessation, but overall, broadly speaking, I would say do not use tobacco products to include vaping. Um, eat a predominantly plant-based diet. Try to have this be low in processed foods. One tip that we know we can do, shop the perimeter of your grocery store. Think about your grocery store. On the outside edges is where you find most of your whole foods, your fruits and vegetables, the bins that have you know nuts and, and things like grains and oatmeals. You also have your meats and your dairy products. They're all around the perimeter. In the middle is where you find all the processed things. So if you can try to shop the outside, you're likely going to be eating a less processed food diet. Um, try to exercise at least five days a week. This doesn't have to be hard or high intensity. This can just be a casual walk where you're just getting out and moving your body. Try to decrease your sedentary time, park further away, take the stairs. These things add up. Try to fit strength training in. Again, this doesn't have to mean going to the gym or CrossFit and lifting tons of weight. It can be something as simple as doing body weight exercises. And in fact, we should very shortly have um, you can join classes at Sylvester where you can take classes that have strength training incorporated into them. Um, achieving and maintaining a healthy body weight as much as possible, but with the caveat that even if you don't lose a pound, but you change your body composition, that does have a difference. So I think anything helps in that space. Um, complete your recommended screenings. You're going to hear a lot about this tonight, I think. Make sure you know when your screenings are due and make the time to do them. Set them if you want to every year at a certain time, maybe around your birthday or a certain month. Maybe it's February because it's Cancer Prevention Month and you're going to do all your screenings in February. But do your screenings and make the time. You're worth it. Uh, don't consume alcohol if at all possible or limit your consumption. Uh, reduce your environmental exposures. You know, Try to be not be exposed to things like asbestos. We know those are harmful. Uh, chemical pesticides. You know, Limit your exposure there. Use your sunblock. We live in South Florida. If you're here in South Florida, we have a lot of sun exposure. Make sure you're putting your sunscreen on, wear long clothing, um, even on cloudy days. Um, eliminate exposure to oncogenic viruses. What are those? That's things like HPV, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. You know, these are all things that we know potentially or do, in fact, increase your risk of cancer. So if there is a vaccination available for these infections, take the vaccination and help reduce your exposure. Um, and then prioritize your sleep. I think this is really important. Limit your screen time before you go to bed and reduce your stress. You know, again, another emerging area of research is around sleep and it's, you know, the lack of sleep or poor sleep and carcinogenic behavior and risk factors that I think we're going to continue to see evolve. So with that, I'm going to wrap up a very short and fast presentation for a lot of different things uh, and say thank you. And then I get to unveil for the first time. We haven't used this logo yet to my knowledge uh, publicly, but here is our prevention, support of care and survivorship uh, and our lifestyle medicine program that is rapidly growing and evolving. And part of why you come to a place like Sylvester's because we have this comprehensive care that spans from prevention all the way through to survivorship. And with that, I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Crane. Eye-opening indeed. And uh, I th think the takeaway is you can't change your genetics, but you certainly can change your lifestyle. So we look forward to hearing from you in the Q&A section. But our next panelist now is Dr. Nicholas Borja, a board-certified clinical geneticist and assistant professor of clinical genetics with expertise in diagnosing and managing rare genetic disorders in both pediatric and adult patients. He does research in the field of hereditary cancer susceptibility at Sylvester and serves as an investigator for the Undiagnosed Diseases Network. A Miami native, he places a special emphasis on enhancing patient outcomes through individualized care. Welcome, Dr. Borja. You can start sharing. Okay, wonderful. Um, can you see my screen? Is this... I think, uh, yes, indeed. Okay, great. 
Okay, um, well, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'm honored to be participating in this panel with such distinguished colleagues. Um, and I think that um, there's a lot of synergy between all of our presentations. So hopefully you'll hear echoes of what Dr. Crane uh, just discussed in my own talk and um, some of what I introduce here um, also covered in Dr. Kalfa and Dr. Sussman's uh, presentations later on. So the first um, topic I wanna address is how um, genetics influences our health and our cancer risk, but it does so with quite a bit of complexity. Um, I think it's important to contextualize genetics and to do that, uh, I think a helpful metaphor is to consider genetics as a seed whose growth is not only determined by uh, what lies within it, but is also affected by the quality of the soil that it lies within, as well as exposures like sunshine and rain. And um, there's also the randomness or chance that's always present in all biological systems. Um, and taken together, these factors, not just genetics in isolation, uh, determine what the plant will become. So taking this idea forward, um, I'll uh, start discussing genes more specifically. And these are essentially the blueprints for our cells. We have about 20,000 genes and they're all stuffed into the nucleus of each and every human cell. And in fact, we have two copies of each of our genes, uh, one copy that's inherited from each of our parents. And you can think about genes as providing instructions for each individual cell of our body to take on its specific role. So muscle cells, for instance, express genes for long fibrous filaments that allow for contractions. Um, neurons express genes um, for membrane channels that allow electrical impulses to travel. And uh, liver cells will express genes for specific enzymes that uh, break down foods that we ingest. And understanding this is important because um, the way we think about cancer is that it's essentially a disease of genetic mutations. So as our cells grow and divide, mutations will naturally occur. And um, these will prevent our cells from operating appropriately. And then over time, this can lead to further dysfunction and eventually cancer. Um, so you can imagine that as, um, you know, unicellular creatures evolved into multicellular creatures and then larger organisms with trillions of cells like ourselves, we had to evolve more and more elaborate ways of protecting the integrity of our genes so that our cells could grow and divide appropriately uh, without acquiring additional mutations. And so, in fact, we have genes that are specifically devoted to the task of DNA repair. So their job is specifically to guard our cells against these mutations. And, and so then the question is, okay, well, how do we inherit cancer risk? Um, and cancer risk happens when one of the two copies of a DNA repair gene comes to us um, through one of, from one of our parents or, or spontaneously more rarely, um, and, and that gene is missing. Um, so although our cells can function fine with just a single copy of a DNA repair gene, if a mutation were to occur in that second copy, then this would prevent the gene from working at all. So neither copy of the gene would be functional. And then once you entirely lose the DNA repair gene, it's quite difficult to avoid further mutations and then progression of that cancer. So I wanna be sure to emphasize that uh, genetic cancer predisposition syndromes are, are very diverse. Studies have shown that about 10% of all cancers are associated with an underlying genetic predisposition. And in this table, I'm just presenting a few of the very well-characterized hereditary cancer syndromes that, that'll be covered in later talks. But um, they were among the first identified because they tend to be more penetrant. In other words, um, the, uh, the individuals who are affected with these genetic predisposition syndromes are at much higher risk than the general population for inheriting or for developing cancer. 
Um, and it's important that I say that there are other hereditary cancer syndromes where the increase in cancer risk is more modest. For instance, the DNA repair gene CHECK2 or ATM, where the lifetime risk of breast cancer is um, still greater than the general population, but um, much lower than that seen in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, carriers or, or TP53 or P10 carriers as well. Um, and so at our cancer genetics clinic, we try to make a holistic assessment by taking a very detailed personal and family history. And here I put together a, a pedigree of a hypothetical patient um, and, and labeled the personal and family history. Um, as you can see, this is a, um, an individual who's had two breast cancers. Um, she, her mother has a history of breast cancer as well. She has a maternal aunt who passed away from ovarian cancer. And then she has a maternal grandfather who passed away from pancreas cancer. And so what we're seeing in this pedigree, in other words, a, an outline of the family and personal history of cancer, what we're seeing is cancers that are occurring in every generation, some of which are relatively rare or occurring at an unusually early age. And so this is something that we would see that is very suggestive of a uh, underlying hereditary cancer syndrome um, affecting um, the individual as well as uh, potentially uh, her family members. And so we have national guidelines that are continuously being updated to provide uh, recommendations on who should be tested and, and when we should suspect hereditary cancer syndromes. Um, what, what I uh, really wanna emphasize is that these guidelines are far from perfect and um, the, uh, the evolution of the guidelines is being rapidly outpaced by um, the knowledge in the field that is um, ballooning with respect to uh, genetic mutations causing hereditary cancer risk. And so a recent paper has shown that um, among individuals with cancer, 13.3% of them had a hereditary cancer predisposing genetic change. And only half of these patients who were detected to have hereditary cancer risk, only half of them would have qualified for testing using the traditional guidelines that are often used. And so you may be wondering why um, hereditary cancer wouldn't be evident in the way that I show you previously. But um, one thing to remember is that these syndromes confer an increased risk, but there are still individuals and families who inherit these, um, these risk factors that will nevertheless not develop cancer. And oftentimes we also have limitations insofar as uh, cancer patients may come from small families. Um, sometimes they have parents who passed away from a different cause and never uh, were identified therefore as, as having cancer. Um, and there are also families where cancer diagnoses aren't discussed or shared openly. Um, so at UM, we have tried to stay at the cutting edge and we offer uh, hereditary cancer testing much more broadly because we recognize how important it is, not just for the individual, but his or her family to not miss a case of hereditary cancer susceptibility. So the good news is that uh, hereditary cancer testing is easy. We only work uh, with the top labs in the United States and um, testing is at least is is almost always covered by insurance, at least partially. Um, the out-of-pocket max um, the, for, for most patients um, is $250. And we, we can collect samples from saliva, cheek swabs, or blood. Um, sometimes that varies depending on the, the clinical context. And, and we sequence up to 100 genes that, that are known to be involved with hereditary cancer susceptibility. Um, and we get results in, in about three weeks. And um, one important thing I want to note now is that um, many patients will not be found to have hereditary cancer susceptibility, but we always wanna emphasize that um, even with a negative result, that doesn't necessarily mean that your cancer risk is equivalent to the general population. If based on your personal or family history, um, there is a strong suspicion of a you know, underlying genetic risk um, for cancer susceptibility, then 
a negative result could be the result of us not having yet identified the gene that is contributing to your cancer risk. And actually, my research is focused on trying to uncover new genes that have yet to be discovered. And um, another potential cause is, as Dr. Crane mentioned in the study that she was discussing, there are common genetic variants um, pre present widely throughout the population that, that have a very small influence on our cancer risk. But because there are many of these variants, they can add up together and have a quite sizable influence. Um, so that's an important consideration um, when you're getting your results. And you know, the last thing I want to end on is that the beauty of getting testing done is that we can provide a much more personalized and um, precise understanding of your risk um, and use that to tailor recommendations for surveillance, for risk reduction, and sometimes even cancer treatment. Um, also, the preventative benefits from discovering hereditary cancer susceptibility, they cascade to um, any other family members who subsequently get tested and are found to have um, the same uh, cancer susceptibility. So, you know, I wanna acknowledge that um, some individuals, and, and I think this is very understandable, feel ambivalent about genetic testing. And I think um, in, in distinction to, to what Dr. Crane was discussing, Genetics is something that we can't really control um, on, in isolation. Um, but I think it's also really important to remember that um, the unknown cancer poses a much greater threat to our health than the one we're aware of and taking action against. So with that, thank you for your time and attention. And um, I look forward thank to helping anyone I can. Thank you so much, Dr. Borja. An empowering message. Uh, it's Education is power. It's good to know. So our next panelist now is Dr. Carmen Kalfa, a breast medical oncologist who serves as the medical co-director for the Cancer Survivorship and Translational Behavioral Science Program at Sylvester. She's also associate director of community outreach of the breast cancer program. And her career focus is building expertise in breast cancer prevention, treatment, and survivorship. Dr. Kalfa is the clinical research lead for the Breast Site Disease Group and physician leader of the Genetic Predisposition Syndrome Initiative at Sylvester. Let's welcome Dr. Kalfa. Thank you so much, Ileana. Just want to make sure you see my slide. Yes, we see it. I think that should work. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I had a lot of patients and uh, team members that said, see you tonight. So if I uh, don't see you. Uh, I know you're there. And uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be sharing the night with uh, such esteemed colleagues. And that's the beauty that we have at Sylvester. We are a team and we reach out to each other throughout the day, throughout the week, weekends to really come up with a personalized approach for every patient. And uh, since I came at Sylvester, I were able to, uh, to have Dr. Tracy Crane join us. Before she came, I was writing prescriptions on a little prescription pad and uh, we drown big and I see this lifestyle medicine growing and our patients taking so much advantage of that and so much benefit. And also since I came, we were able to recruit Dr. Borja. So this is all like a dream coming through and Dr. Susman and I did fellowship together. So I think it's like a big family having a great talk tonight and welcoming you all. And I hope you learn from every one of us. There's so much to share. We're gonna go quickly through my slides and I'm gonna try to keep the time down, but you know, I'm a breast medical oncologist. So as much as I wanna talk about everything else, it's gonna to be too much. So I'm gonna focus on the genes and breast cancer and also share the amazing program that we build thanks to the generosity of Eileen and her family. I just want you to see the statistics for the breast cancer. And unfortunately, every year when I update my slides, the number is going up. Uh, the total number of new cases for 2023, it's estimated to be almost 300,000 if you don't count the DCIS. And for those on, on the call that had DCIS, you know that that's not trivial either. You can have the same treatment like you have for invasive breast cancer. So that's a stage zero. Uh, curable breast cancer, but however, patients, you know, would prevent it if they could. So that makes it the 350,000. 
for every 100 women, we diagnose one man. As you know, we're still losing because the number of total cases is going up every year, even though the progress is so significant. And for those that DCC with us this weekend, you see how we go out and we raise money and we do cancer research. And the chance of dying from breast cancer had dropped by 58% in the last four decades. So that's huge. The only not so good news about that is that we're still losing about 43,000 plus women every year to breast cancer. And that's devastating. And we cannot let that continue to happen. The also not bad news basically is the fact that for those diagnosed younger than 50, uh, the progress that we're talking about is really not there. So for anything that we could do to prevent breast cancer, it's worth doing. And if you need to give up your glass of wine, I did give up mine. So talking about the risk factors, so you learn that there is familiar risk factors. There are sometimes genes that you can identify, but there are so many other risk factors. And you learn from Dr. Crane that many of those are modifiable risk factors. You also learn that breast cancer is about one in eight, and that's in general population. If the risk is high, that's usually one in four. And if you have a genetic mutation, it could get up to 87% or so. So I just listed, we just have them listed here, the risk factors. And you can look at some of them. And I know in the chat, somebody asked about getting older and getting cancer. For some cancers, and for the majority of them, as we get older, the cancer goes up. That's an unmodifiable, right? You can go to all your plastic surgeon friends, but the age changes. And getting older, having breast, and being a woman are the three risk factors that you cannot modify. And just you cannot modify the genetics, but you can modify the rest. And you learn that from Dr. Crane. And we have a huge program at Sylvester just focus on prevention and risk reduction. The alcohol, um, it's really significant. And I compare to having a first degree relative with breast cancer. And if you come and you say, my mom had it and I'm so afraid I'm going to get it. Well, so is if you drink every day, one glass at least a day. Obesity, you know what to do about that. And exercise, you already heard about that. So quantifying risk um, with or without the genetic mutations. So if you have a genetic mutation, that's all the way into the high risk on the right side of the screen. And that's where you have your genetic mutations, some of them listed there, some with a higher risk than others, as you learned from Dr. Borja. But you also have the very strong family histories, the chest wall radiation for a previous lymphoma that happened at a young age. And that's when mam mammogram and MRI start at a much younger age, like at 25 or 30. And waiting until you're 40 to have your first mammogram could put you a decade late behind your screening. There's also the average risk. Any woman uh, has a risk about one in eight as she grows to be an older person in the seven, mid 70s. For those, mammograms should start at age 40. It's yearly and it's shown to maximize mortality reduction. So you cannot swap the mammogram for an ultrasound. It's not going to do the same thing. For those that have an intermediate risk where it's 15 to 20%, so it's high risk over 20% and then very high risk over 50%, but those are the intermediate risk. Um, and if you have dense breast, please ask uh, the radiologist to consider giving you an ultrasound. And you know what, if they haven't offered it to you, then you probably should look at another imaging center to have your breast images done because dense breast should be followed with mammogram ultrasound at um at UIM, the University of Miami Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, we actually have contrast enhanced mammography for those that cannot have an MRI or they're recommended to have twice a year screening and that's a preferred method for them. So genetics, um, just look here and know that Mary Claire King, professor uh, at the University of California, she discovered the BRCA1 gene in 1990. I had the pleasure to meet her and she even allowed me to take a selfie with her, but she asked me not to share it. And, uh, and I won't, but I treasure that forever. So that's in 1990, right? And we heard about the genes to some extent, especially the medical professionals, but not until uh, May 2013, which is about 10 years now, when Angelina spoke about her journey. And that empowered a lot of women and men to really look into it and, and be um, taking tests and then knowing how to quantify and how to take uh, reduction strategies. So 
you heard from Dr. Borja, right, that who should get genetic testing. And it's interesting because at Sylvester, we really uh, try to change the status quo. There are multiple studies coming from reputable NCI institutions showing that genetic testing is really underutilized. And this graph is just showing you that if you just follow the guidelines, you're going to miss half of the people, even with the breast cancer. So the BRCA1 and the 2, if you just test for those, um, and if you find only those that have a genetic mutation omitting the guidelines, you're going to have the red bar to the left. And then if you test for a multi-gene panel uh, for more patients than the ones that meet the guidelines, you're going to double up that number from a 12 to 24%. So that tells you that uh, the new trends of testing broadly with broader panels is something that everybody should be following those directions. So this is also showing you that if you test with broad panels, you're going to find a lot more genes than just the BRCA1 and the BRCA2. This is a message that I have for everyone. If you were tested in the past uh, because you had breast cancer or other cancers and you met guidelines in the past and you had a BRCA and now you're really sure that BRCA was negative and I can just move on, please have a conversation with your healthcare provider and ask for an expanded genetic panel. Um, you can find out that yes, you do not carry a BRCA mutation, but you carry a check to mutation or pop to mutation and others. And even though the risk is not as high as with the BRCA, um, depending on the family history, the check to can be responsible for what you see in certain families. We retested many of our family families that had cancer um, in several family members, and we found the other gene that was responsible, and they were falsely reassured that they had nothing to worry about because the BRCA was negative. So this is just showing you how other cancers are associated with uh, genetic mutations, pathogenic genetic mutation. And you can see the breast, you can see ovarian cancer, like 20% of the time you're gonna find a mutation, endometrial, colorectal, pancreatic, other GI cancers, prostate. And the lower uh, bar is showing you that if you met genetic guidelines criteria, the blue bar was the time when the patient was found to have a mutation. But if the criteria were not met and the patient was still tested, look how many patients they were found to be positive carriers for pathogenic mutations you would have never known. And it's not only affecting the person care, but it's affecting every first degree relative and their families. So it's hundreds and thousands of patients that have no idea about their risk unless you start testing. So I'm just showing you briefly here that uh, the genetic testing, uh, that the genes um, can have different risk, as you know, and the BRCA1 and 2 are top, but you see the PAL2, which is behaving like a BRCA2, and then you see the rest of them, the CHAG, the BAR, the ATM. We can talk more about this if you're interested uh, on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis. So this is also showing you um, what you learned from Dr. Borja, that uh, the penetrance matters, right? And that's where all the way to the right, you have genes that increase the risk more than five times. And then you have the ones in the middle with a two to five time increased risk. And that's where the check two and the ATM genes fall into. This is important, right? Because if you know you have a genetic mutation, then your screening and surveillance is different. You're not gonna have the same surveillance if you have a gene or if you don't, or if you have family members that have the same cancer and don't. So knowing that allows you to quantify your personal risk and allows you to really follow the appropriate guidelines to have your screening and what cancers do you screen for and what age do you start? When do you see Dr. Sussman for the pancreatic cancer risk and other specialists at Sylvester? So this is is all guidelines based, but you are not going to be able to apply any guidelines unless you know what category you belong to. This is just to show you that cancers with inherited mutation, you can look here in the, in the green bars and you can even find the lung cancer, which is fascinating because we're learning more that even BRCA2 patients can have an increase of uh, risk of lung cancer. If you look at the rest of the genes, yes, the majority of them are the BRCA, but look at the rest of the pie and that's in the breast cancer population. So what happened? So you see this beautiful Eileen, she was my patient. I cared for her for a decade, I think. Uh, she was a ball of fire and energy and she would take every patient by hand and bring them to me and say, you need to help this person. You need to help her get genetic testing. I can't stand it. And uh, she advocated and she took one person by hand at a time and she helped them to get genetic testing. And once they had the test done, they would come back to me and say, now you need to help me to take care of them because they need so much. And we just learned from genetic counseling that they need to have 
every month another type of screening and where do they go and all that. So she lived her dream to see that genetic testing, uh, especially in the Ashkenazi Jew population, was more affordable and more available to all. But as she was growing older with me, we're just starting to talk about, you know, so what happened once they get diagnosed? There's no program where you can just go there and be cared for in the multidisciplinary fashion where you feel like the team knows what they're doing and they're applying all screening, but also preventative strategies, research, coordination of care, and life can be lived in a really positive and uplifting way and not feel like you're dragging from one appointment to another, from one hospital to another. So we drummed big, right? And unfortunately, I lost Eileen to cancer, but I met Haley through this process and Haley was texting with me and, you know, being the best advocate for her mom. And I'm so fortunate that she came back and she said, you know, I have a dream. And uh, she said, I want to have a round table where everybody kind of listens to what they need to do. And I continue to empower people like my mom did. And I asked her if she wanted to know what her mom was up to right before we lost her. And she did want to know that. So she knew that was more than just getting them tested. Now the dream was to build a place where they can all be cared for, not only themselves, but their first degree relatives and their, their children and their next generations as well. So we're able to build through their generosity. We're able to build this place. If you haven't been uh, to Sylvester's second floor, it's right there by the fish tank. That's where I wanted to have it. So everybody knows that to find it. It's virtual or in person. And I have an amazing team behind that it was all assembled and recruited one by one. So this is the, the pillars of this initiative was to really have a coordinated care that focuses on education, research, prevention, and survivorship. And as you could see, uh, we have even a bipartisan support to uh, pass uh, the bill that allows patients to have what they need, Medicare or not. And that's some of the colleagues at Sylvester that are really dedicating their lives to cancer research and being part of this large team that is behind this initiative. So I'm going to end with showing you how we build this. Uh, we call it the GPS because we thought it was a cute name that uh, tell people that you have actually a map that will take you to where you need to be. Uh, and that's the core of all these other uh, programs that we have. The programs are not only for treatment, but for cancer prevention. So we are interacting based on gene high risk versus non-gene high risk. And we build for every single program. We have something in place that will address your needs if you have average risk, high risk, or if you're uh, having a car uh, carrying a genetic predisposition. So with this, I'm going to just say one more thing. I hope at the end, I can just invite you all to the Precision Medicine Conference on May 4th. Uh, it's open to patients as well as healthcare providers and is really taking prevention and uh, treatment and survivorship to the latest scientific uh, evidence that you have. So thank you so much for having me and I really love hearing everything uh, that everyone has to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalfa. Inspirational as always. And I'm sure that uh, through your office or somehow through the chat or something, we can provide more information on that conference that you me just mentioned. But let's move on to our final Final panelist right now, Dr. Daniel Sussman, who is a gastroenterologist and professor of clinical medicine at the UM Miller School of Medicine. He focuses on the prevention of colorectal cancer and cancers of the gastrointestinal tract. He co-manages a multidisciplinary GI cancer prevention clinic in collaboration with the genetics department to assess at-risk patients, and he serves as the medical director for digestive health services. Let's welcome Dr. Sussman. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for taking time out of your evening schedule to uh, to listen to all of us today. Um, you know, this portion of the presentation is going to be uh, the gut check, talking um, about the impact of some of these um, diseases, uh, most specifically on the colon. And we're going to start out by talking a little bit about colon cancer risk for the average person uh, walking the street, and then we're going to move into a little bit of the colon cancer risk for those who. Um, who have inherited cancer syndromes where they have an even higher risk than the average population. Um, some of the major take-home points that I just want to make sure we get across today are, are pointed out on this uh, first slide here, um, is that the, the general premise of that colorectal cancer screening is that when people have early stage curable colorectal cancers, they have no symptoms. And this really underscores why we screen every human being in the United States for colorectal cancer once they reach an appropriate age because they have no symptoms and there might be something lurking inside uh, that's at a curable uh, stage. The next point I want to make 
is that because we are screening everybody, we have to decide the appropriate timing of that screening. Those who are considered at average risk for colorectal cancer screening begin that screening at the age of 45 years. Average risk basically means that you don't have a genetic mutation that increases colorectal cancer risk, and you don't come from a family where there's other individuals with colorectal cancer. If you do, however, have a genetic mutation that increases cancer risk, or you come from a family where there's individuals who have colorectal cancer, that age to begin the screening actually gets dialed down. Uh, that's a complicated process, but to try to simplify it a little bit, if you have one first degree relative, which would be a, a parent, a brother, sister, um, who has colorectal cancer, you should start your colon cancer screening generally at age 40 or younger if that individual had had colorectal cancer at a younger age. And then each of the genetic mutations that we're going to talk about has a very uh, distinct and specific recipe for screening that goes with it that starts colorectal cancer at earlier ages. Some of these cancer phenotypes are so severe that individuals begin their uh, colorectal cancer screening in the teenage years, believe it or not. Um, and the last major point that I want to get across here, um, alluding to, um, to, uh, to the symbolic reference that Dr. Borja made earlier, is that um, colorectal cancer um, frequently has uh, uh, a nidus that starts it, but the environment in which uh, we work tends to um, determine whether or not a cancer ends up developing. And the one important fact that we can um, hammer home over and over again here is that a diet that's high in red meats, and very specifically the subcategory of red meats that are processed red meats that you might get from a deli counter that come wrapped in plastics, which would be um, sausages, ham, bacon, uh, bologna, salami, chorizos, salchichas, whatever you want to call the sausages, those are the absolute worst for colorectal cancer risk, and those should be avoided if at all possible. Um, we recognize that, you know, humans are humans and life has to be worth living, so everything in moderation. You don't have to completely stop, but everything in moderation. And, you know, if you follow these, uh, these general guidances, uh, you'll be um, one step healthier. So what are the risk factors for colorectal cancer? Age is certainly uh, one of the major risk factors. Uh, again, for the average person walking around being over the age of 45 is that important risk factor. Diets that are high in fat are particularly uh, cancer promoting. Uh, and diets that are low in fiber also seem to be cancer promoting. So it's not just that you need to be avoiding these red meats and these processed meats, but it's probably beneficial for us also to ingest a high fiber diet for the purpose of, uh, of cancer prevention. Um, if patients themselves or, uh, or multiple people in a family have a history of colon polyps or colorectal cancer, that certainly increases risks for an individual to get cancer in the future. And there's some inherited and, and, um, and familial disorders where people can get tremendous numbers of polyps. And those are the individuals that I mentioned earlier that might start their cancer screening at tremendously young ages, like in, the, in their teenage years. Um, and again, some of these genetic defects cause people to get colon cancer at young ages. And then um, less common, uh, fortunately, um, because we now do a much better job of treating some of these inflammatory diseases of the colon, um, people who have inflammatory disorders like ulcerative colitis of the colon for many, many years uh, do have an increased risk for colorectal cancer over time. Um, you know, going back to, um, to what can we do to, to intervene uh, to kind of ameliorate some of these risk factors, colorectal cancer screening is effective. And we're really fortunate with colorectal cancer in that the screening tests that we have in place work really well. And part of the reason that they work really well is they do a really good job at identifying precancerous findings and treating them before they turn into cancer. So this underlies the, the, the multiple choice question I popped up here is, what are the features of colorectal cancer that really make it amenable to colorectal cancer screening? Well, the precursor, the main precursor of colorectal cancer are polyps. Polyps are little bumps that grow in the colon. And if you leave those little bumps or those little polyps in place for a period of many years, they can turn into cancers. The tests that we have for colorectal cancer screening do a really great job at identifying those polyps. And when, there's, when they're found, we can do relatively non-invasive tests to go in and remove those polyps without patients needing surgery. These polyps are also really common. Um, and it turns out that probably somewhere uh, in the ballpark of 25 to 30% of individuals over the age of 45 have colon polyps. And so because polyps are so prevalent, 
and because we can remove them to prevent cancer, this is one of the major reasons why we do colorectal cancer screening on everybody once they hit a certain age. Also, I previously mentioned that colorectal cancer patients are usually without symptoms uh, at an early stage. Uh, patients can get symptoms once the colon cancer grows to, uh, to a, an appreciable size. That can be rectal bleeding, anemia, uh, severe constipation or a change in the bowel habits. But again, most patients who have colorectal cancer and almost all patients who have colon polyps have no symptoms. Um, and then, you know, the last item here is that when we do remove these colon polyps non-surgically, it prevents colon cancer in almost all individuals. Um, so how is it that we, uh, that we address these polyps? Well, we have many different types of colorectal cancer screening tests at our disposal. Some of them are stool-based tests where you can submit a stool sample to a laboratory uh, to look for colorectal cancer. Um, but we also have colonoscopy. Um, colonoscopy is a procedure that's kind of um, the staple of the existence of a lot of gastroenterologists like myself. Um, and for this test, we clean out the colon. Uh, patients come to see us. Um, most patients who get this study done um, will get some medication to go to sleep for the study. And we look inside the colon with a camera on the end of a flexible tube. Um, and uh, by going in the colon with this flexible tube, using this device, we can actually remove these precancerous colon polyps. And that prevents probably somewhere in the ballpark of 80 to 90% of people from ever getting uh, colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer screening is, is highly, highly effective. Um, sorry, I have a little delay on my slides here. Um, now, Dr. Borja and Dr. Kalfa um, both mentioned that there are certain families where there's a genetic predisposition to cancer. And so how is it that we identify somebody as being from one of these families? Well, this gets back to the question of who should get a genetic evaluation. Those people who should get a genetic evaluation are those who have uh, cancers at young ages. If we're talking specifically about colorectal cancer, that age would be the age under 50. Um, any individual who has a personal history of uh, cancer under the age of 50 or multiple colon cancers would be a strong candidate for this genetic testing. And as Dr. Borja mentioned, this genetic testing is really easy to perform. It's cheap and it's very uh, accessible, um, either being by saliva testing or a simple blood draw that can be done um, in the comfort of your home or while you're at work. Um, and then, you know, if you take a history of cancer from a patient and you find out that they have multiple individuals in their family with a variety of different cancers, especially those that are affecting people from every generation, those patients are considered very high candidates uh, to find a genetic mutation as the cause for the cancers in those families. And on the far right of your screen here, um, you can see what's called a pedigree, uh, where this is somebody's family cancer history. And you can see that this is a type of cancer that affects people in every generation uh, and uh, affects both men and women. And this family called Family G was in fact the very first family that had a very specific type of genetic cancer predisposition that's called Lynch syndrome that we're gonna talk about on the next slide. Now, the, another important item to mention here is that when genetic testing is performed and a genetic result comes back as abnormal, meaning that we have found a gene that explains the cancers in the family, there's several really important features that come from that. It improves the way that we screen for cancers, not just colorectal cancer, but other cancers as well, including uterine cancers, breast cancers, and possibly even pancreatic cancers. Um, but when people have a negative genetic testing result in the setting of a family history of cancer, sometimes they get relief about some of the uncertainty and, and, and anxiety about unknown cancer risks. And it really also provides um, a roadmap for other relatives. So if an individual in a family develops um, uh, or is found to have a mutation that contributes to cancer risk, other people in the family can get tested for that same gene. Um, and so those people can undergo cancer screening tests to prevent them from ever getting cancer. And they can also um, have some assistance with lifestyle decision-making to try to um, undergo some really innovative um, fertility-related rela um, um, uh, interventions that can actually remove some of these cancer-related genes from families altogether. Now, I mentioned we were going to be talking about um, Lynch syndrome. Um, Lynch syndrome is a, uh, an inherited disorder uh, of cancer. And that basically means that people were born with a defect um, in genes that usually make proteins that circulate and look for errors or mistakes in DNA during its replication. And when those DNA defects are permitted um, to exist in the cells without being corrected, that's what increases cancer risk. These, uh, some subtypes of individuals with Lynch syndrome have such a high lifetime cancer risk 
that for colorectal cancer, they might have as much as an 80% lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer. Women might have a 60% lifetime risk of developing endometrial cancer. And these people have this defect usually in every cell of their body. And so they can even have increased risk for stomach, ovarian, and several other different cancer types. Um, sorry, my, my screen keeps freezing here. Um, now, um, what happens once somebody actually gets um, a genetic diagnosis? So let's take the example here of, of somebody who has Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome doesn't respect the colon. It affects every cell of the body. And because of that, a multidisciplinary team is usually helpful as part of caring for these patients. Um, Dr. Kalfa mentioned uh, the genetic predisposition clinic serving as the primary care for these patients. Um, and those primary care providers usually refer for the specialty care for colonoscopies to gastroenterologists, gynecologists for family planning and for preventive surgeries to try to prevent cancers from forming, um, and other specialists like oncologists if cancers unfortunately do end up developing. Um, but again, uh, these tests that we have uh, for cancer screening are highly effective for patients with Lynch syndrome. And colonoscopy and some of the other interventions like surgeries and screening tests on the screen on the screen here go a tremendous way in actually preventing cancers and preventing people from dying from cancers in these individuals. And you know, finally, just to kind of wrap up here, if somebody in your family or yourself is eventually found to have a genetic mutation, it's really important to realize that this is not a death sentence. Not everybody who has a genetic cancer risk mutation will go on to get cancer. Uh, and knowledge is power, meaning that if you know about a, a problem before it happens, you can intervene and get preventive care to prevent somebody from ever getting cancer. Thank you, Dr. Sussman. Very informative. Uh, we appreciate it. And as you can see, everyone, it's uh, been a, a night chock full of information and education, and we're running out of time, but we certainly want to welcome back Haley UT, who uh, her, the foundation she co-founded has pledged $2 million to establish the Genetic Predisposition Syndrome Initiative at Sylvester. So Haley, if you could just tell us more about the inspiration in, in launching this initiative at Sylvester. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was all really informative. And everything that all of these incredible doctors talked about was a really big part of why we wanted to start this foundation and open the Eileen Udy Predisposition Syndrome Initiative. Specifically, our mission is to educate people about genetic predisposition syndromes, prevent hereditary cancers, and provide support to those who are dealing with cancer and their loved ones. Um, my mom, when she got diagnosed, she said that if she was able to save one life, then it would all have been worth it. And with that, she really went on a mission to, while she was alive, to really get the Ashkenazi Jewish community tested for BRCA as she had a BRCA1 gene mutation. And so when she passed away, that was really my goal. And in talking to Carmen and to my brother and dad, who also founded this initiative with me, we realized that there are so many hereditary cancers and that those are ones that can be preventable. And especially as younger voices, I'm 28, my brother is 26. Um, I know it's recommended if you have any sort of family history to be tested at around age 25. And so many people don't have that education, people in the Ashkenazi Jewish community. And as we've learned, so many people in every community um, can are likely to have predisposition syndromes, um, not just BRCA, but so many of the other ones that these doctors touched on. And so our first big project has really been the predisposition syndrome initiative and the GPS clinic at Sylvester. Carmen was my mom's incredible doctor and she has been the best partner throughout all of this. Um, and just a really big inspiration was in really pushing people to get tested. My mom was able to save so many people's lives because people already didn't realize they had cancer or found out that they had these and were able to take steps. And so, especially in our community and in Miami, we feel like that education is increasing. But when I started to tell people to get tested, especially boys and girls my age, the ones who did find out that they had predisposition syndromes were like, great, I now know this horrible thing and I don't have the tools to deal with that. And so that's kind of when we came up with this concept to have a first of its kind specialized cancer care um, clinic. 
at Sylvester. And I know Carmen walked everyone through that about why it's been amazing. They have all different types of world-renowned doctors already at their disposal. So we just really worked on hiring geneticists and something that was really important to us was also a psychologist because mental health is such an important part. And we have these incredible advanced nurse practitioners that are there to hold your hand throughout the whole process. And so first of all, I just know that's the type of care that my mom would have loved to have and like really tried to help give others. And just in general, if she had this knowledge that she had a genetic predisposition, she could still be alive today. And I know that a lot of people are scared to get tested. Um, they just think ignorance is bliss. And for example, if you find out you have BRCA and you don't already have a family, then you have to start thinking about that family planning really early and it can be scary. But that's exactly why we created um, this clinic and we hope to be able to replicate that and continue to educate people young and old because you won't only be saving your own life but you could save the lives of so many of your family members since it's hereditary thank you Haley um, articulate beautiful message your mother would be proud uh, what a legacy she leaves and what an advocacy she has in you and your family. We thank you for your generosity. Tonight's talk has been eye-opening. Uh, there have been a lot of questions, and thank you to our panelists who have answered them directly. Questions such as, does health insurance cover the genetic testing? A lot of this. So what we're going to do in the interest of time with all our wonderful experts here who are ready to answer them all is... We're going to drive people to the website. We're going to drive them to the contact information um, as our talk has wrapped up. I, I thank you all. And now we're going to transition to the screen where people can learn more. There you go. The high-risk clinic at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, and there is the number um, for appointments, the 305-689-RISK, which is 7475 and go to the website because you can actually see you fill out the questionnaire and see if you qualify for the genetic testing if you have the right uh, profile if you will sylvestercancerprevention.com you can actually scan the qr code on your screen and take it from there everyone but we thank you all so much for being a part of it tonight uh, thank you to our panelists bravo thank you all for being here with us tonight and uh, to you for being a great audience. So uh, stay safe, everyone, and have a wonderful night until we see each other again on screen. Good night.